Well, today we're going to do a flying trip through, like I told you last week, we're going to do alternators and charging this time. This is not a, a comprehensive, exhaustive course that's going to tell you everything about every car, but I am going to have some thoughts to share with you along the way. So I hope you're having a good Monday so far, and I really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, hope you'll watch it all the way through. Here we go. Now, most people that know anything about electrical stuff know that the alternator has to work over a wide range of temperatures and RPM ranges to keep the battery charged while the vehicle is being driven. Uh, they use induction. Whenever you have sweep magnetism over copper coils, it creates energy. And so what we do is they put this rotor spinning inside of a stator and this is really not an accurate representation. This is supposed to represent induction, but this is not exactly like what you would see inside an alternator. Because you notice this has permanent magnets and that kind of thing. In this particular case, if you spun this next to these magnets, you would create juice in the windings in the part that's spinning. But that's not the way an alternator works. But the old car generator... Uh, was similar in construction to a starter because it had brushes and a commutator. And the brushes sliding on the commutator did the same job that the rectifier does in an alternator. Uh, the, uh, alter the current that was created was created in the part that spins in the armature, the part in the middle. And the field coils were magnetized and that's what provided that magnetism for that. And so whenever the the brushes would call, would uh, make sure that the, all of the current that was leaving the unit was DC despite the fact that it was AC when it was created by these north and south poles whipping across and you got these voltage regulators on, uh, the, that were had to be <clears throat> if you didn't if you I had to replace generators on some of these older vehicles back in my early years of mechanic work <clears throat> and typically on one of these you had to polarize the generator or it would try, or it would try to charge the battery backwards, um, and you had to know how to do that at the regulator. The, the voltage regulator was mounted usually on the body or the <coughs> the bulkhead. Excuse me for that cough. But anyway, that's just a little bit of a. And you could take if you were wanting to test a generator, you could put a generator in the vise and hook a battery up to it, and it'd spin like a starter, <laughs> which was pretty cool. Um, but you might notice that on, the, uh, on this uh, generator and on the alternator, uh, these pulleys are small. And the reason they make the pulley small is so it will spin really fast. Now, they put bigger pulleys on stuff like power steering pumps and air conditioners because they don't need to spin all that fast, but they need to have a lot of power. So it's like a, a lower gear. <clears throat> but you got a high gear on this alternator or a generator because you want it to spin really fast and produce a lot of juice. There were times when I was at a Ford place when some of these people would putter around town with their uh, air conditioner on high and running, you know, radios that pulled a lot of current and stuff like that. And it would slowly kill the battery because the alternator was not putting out enough when they were sitting still or when they were driving really slow. And the way that we would solve that problem was we would get a smaller pulley and put on the alternator to spin it faster. Now you got to think about how fast that alternator is spinning. It's got to be able to reach speeds of 14,000 RPM if you do the math on the pulley sizes in order and still stay together. You know, first American car to use an alternator instead of a generator was the 1960 Plymouth Valiant. Now that was several years ahead of Ford and General Motors. They adopted alternators in the mid 1960s, and uh, there was a lot of stuff Chrysler did with starters and alternators. It was ahead of the other two domestics, the, the reduction drive starters that Chrysler's had on them that sounded so funky, you know, they had a different sound than anybody else's starter, but those starters were very robust and almost never needed replacing, at least that was my experience, and not, and, you know, compared to the Ford and Chevrolet's. Now today's alternators <clears throat> usually put, on, put out over 100 amps. Uh, back in the day, you know, the, like in the from the 60s up through the 70s, and all typically alternators <clears throat> until you got into the 80s, the alternators was usually putting out about 50 or 60 amps, uh, unless you had some sort of special uh, application or something. 
but Taurus came out in 1986. It had a heated windshield uh, that required more current. Uh, the, that 86 Taurus did. Now that didn't last a long time, but they put a bigger, more robust, heavier duty alternator on those to handle the extra current required for that heated windshield. And uh, after that, you know, the alternators, even though they were smaller, would still put out 100, 130, 140 amps. You need to pay attention to how many amps your alternator is because it'll, typically it's a bolt-on replacement. But if you've got a choice between a 120 amp alternator and a 140 amp alternator, you're going to pay a little more for the 140 amp alternator, but you'll be happier with it if you'll go ahead and put one of those on there and it doesn't hurt a doggone thing. I would not go the other way though and put a 120 amp where 140 amp was to start with or 130. It'll say on the alternator what the amp output rating is typically. And so you can usually go by that. <clears throat> the winding is the belt and pulley actually spins the magnetic field, which is the rotor, through the stationary outer winding. And they call any stationary winding in a distributor or in an alternator is called a stator. And that's where the alternating current is created is in the outer part of this. In other words, it's, it's created in these windings here. The magnetism that creates it is here and it's fed in. You get uh, power and ground fed through these brushes in a controlled fashion. It's, you know, radially, so you don't want it overcharging a battery. Uh, you know, if you get, for some reason, a, a full fielded alternator will put too much juice in a battery and boil it and everything out. <clears throat> I had seen a motor ohm one time. Typically when you had one that was overcharging, like when you would hook your charging system tester up and it would be putting out like 18 and a half volts or something stupid like that, you would typically have a problem with the voltage regulator. And that would be where the issue was most of the time. You know, it could be something else, but usually it was voltage regulator. And I had a motor home came in there, and it was whenever it was at, it was putting out normally until you gave it a little gas, and then it would peg out and put out too much. I replaced the voltage regulator, but it turned out on that one, this thing was centrifugal force inside the alternator as you picked up speed was causing it to full field itself. And it was causing it, but that's the only time I ever saw that the whole time. But it was, I had to replace the alternator after replacing the voltage regulator. I had to go back and replace the whole alternator. Uh, the rotor spins inside a winding called a stator with a laminated core. And the gap between the rotor and the stator is about 40 thousandths of an inch. Now you, uh, you know, this right here, this part of the claw would be a one polarity and the other would be, I guess would be, this would be north and this would be south or whatever. And so they're going to go back and forth and that's where that alternating current's coming from, when they call it an alternator. Um, from what I was understanding, the the nineteen the J1930 regulation from SAE said you're supposed to call all of these a generator now because if they're controlled by the PCM. Uh, but I wrote an article for uh, Visteon about their alternators a few years ago and uh, I was talking to some of the Visteon people on the phone about it, and I said, "Isn't this supposed to be called a generator?" And he goes, "I don't care what anybody says. This is an alternator." <laughs> that was the Visteon guy I was talking to. <clears throat> Brushes and regulators. Early on, these regulators had these electromagnetic uh, components on the inside that were that would regulate. And I always remembered when I was wiring up charging systems on forklifts and stuff that had Delco charging systems. Uh, this was FRBI. I is the terminal that turns on a regulator and that comes through the light. It grounds that I terminal and turns the charge light on when it's not working. Okay, the, the B terminal goes to the battery and that's what, how it tells uh, what it needs to do with the field. The F terminal is the field terminal and the R terminal is wired to one leg of the stator uh, so that it can determine if the alternator is putting out or not. If the alternator is not putting out, it grounds this wire, uh, which turns on the charge light, you know. And, uh, and so that's how that works. But anyway, uh, I always remembered that, though. It's, it's FRBI. That's how the, uh, and the Ford was a little different. Um, and incidentally, on the older Ford systems that had a regulators like this one, um, the Ford one, had the field, the alternator field, that would be one of these brushes here. I mean, one of these. It, it, they had this thing uh, hardwired to power 
no, excuse me, to ground, and the voltage regulator would send power to the rotor. Uh, but most of the time, the rotor will be hardwired. See how it's through a fuse? It'll be hardwired on that one, and this one here receives a ground from the regulator, the PCM, or whatever it is that's regulating it. And they use a duty cycle, you know, 50% duty cycle means it's on and off the equal amounts of time. If it's on 75% of the time, only off 25% uh, of the time, that's 75%. And you can look at the little, this, this right down there, that's what duty cycle's all about. And that's what it uses. If you can get to the field, uh, like on these Ford regulators, you actually can get to the field. There's a screw on the ones with the regulator that's built into the alternator. If you hook your scope up to that, you can actually see what it's doing with that field. It's pretty interesting to watch. Now here's your parts. Uh, if you see the schematic of an alternator, that's the parts you're looking at. You know, this being the rotor. The stator, you might notice the stator is connected to these three. Now the stator is either made like this, with the three connections being like that. They call it a delta wound stator or they got a Y wound stator that's made like this. It's tied together in the middle. Now some of the Ford uh, alternators I used to see you know this goes around and around and, and right there laid in here to the side you would see the uh, place where all three of these windings were tied together. Now these copper windings have got shellac on them so that they're insulated from each other but they're very close to each other um, and if this stuff burns off you can look at the alternator and if these windings right here are all dirty and ugly and brown and uh, you know I'm talking about you know you can tell when they're scorched and burnt and almost black sometimes and that typically basically means that stator is bad and the alternator will probably be noisy. I'll show you a video on that in just a minute. But your regulator, I mean your rectifier bridges look various different ways, you know, and you notice how they're laid in there like this. Uh, so one side of this is grounded, the other side is powered. And so each one of these hooks to a different one of those diode pairs. That's a diode right there. And so all of the power that's coming out of it is forced. It can only leave if it's going in a direct current. And, you know, in other words, alternating current can't leave this thing, you know, and the diodes are the reason for that. <clears throat> okay, so here's the big picture. The rotor's a spinning magnet. AC is created in a stator. The rectifier changes AC to DC. And the field strength is controlled by the voltage regulator. Whether it's in the PCM or wherever it's at, the, the voltage regulator is going to sense that battery voltage. It's got a battery voltage input, and it's going to determine from what it... It's got a target it's shooting for, usually about 14 and a half volts. Even on hybrid vehicles, when the where the small 12 volt battery is charged by the electronics in the back through a DC to DC converter, um, if you switch on the if you energize the system, you you can actually take your meter and connect it to the 12 volt battery. And if you're seeing 14 and a half volts with the system energized, you know that part of it's working like it's supposed to, because that's the way they charge it. They don't have what you'd call a alternator on them, but they're still shooting for 14 and a half volts for optimum battery charge. <clears throat> now 70s model Chryslers, uh, I love those things. They had the very, very simple regulator. There was no pin here at all. Uh, I said not used because it, it was a three terminal, but there was no pin in that one. And the, the terminals, if you looked at the length of them, the one, this one here, turns on the reg The regulator is grounded. And this turns on the regulator, this pin right here, and that little pin there is, if you looked at the way they're made, that pin is shorter. In other words, this one is a shorter pin than this one. And the short one is the one that ground is delivered to the field through that one. Now the field, in the, it's real simple. I mean, it's incredibly simple. Uh, of course, you, this was potted. Uh, this regulator was potted, and uh, that was the so one of the simplest, best working uh, external regulators I'd ever seen. Uh, now, sometimes you would wind up with one that was overcharging or something if the if if the the regulator was loose, hadn't been bolted up good, and the housing wasn't grounded well. That's the way it is on all these. 
what it does on those that have the electromagnetic points on the inside of them, you know, that aren't potted electronic external regulators. If they're loose, it just buzzes and destroys the regulator and welds the points together like a welding machine because it's making a lot of uh, extra, you know, RFI and whatnot in there. Now the external regulator cooling fan was modified and moved inside the case on just about all alternators over the past 30 years. Uh, but from the very beginning, Chrysler did this with their alternators. They always had the fan on the inside of the alternator, which I thought was pretty doggone smart. Some of your light truck diesel applications are fitted with more than one alternator. You'll have a couple. Uh, because if, you, if you're requiring a big bunch of current uh, to be produced by the alternator for whatever your application, uh, it's easier to get to get two, put two small alternators on it than it is to put one great big giant alternator on it. All they do, do, do make those. Ambulances typically, they will, they will replace the, original, the existing alternator on a vehicle they've converted to be an ambulance by putting a big Lease Neville alternator on it that puts out 12 or 1300 amps or something like that. And uh, ambulances typically, whenever you park them, they've got a master switch that disconnects all the electrical from everything because the last thing you need if you're going to go on an ambulance call is to find out that the battery's dead but there's a ton of stuff on an ambulance that can kill the battery so there's a big dog switch down here on the side donk, you know, that it won't even do anything until you turn that on and I used to have to do that when I was working on ambulances at a Ford place now these dual Ford alternators are just wired in series basically I'm sorry, wired parallel, not a series, duh, parallel and they produce a collective 300 amps, you know, if you got a 250 amp ones. And that, you know, it would take a lot bigger alternator to put out 300 amps, you know, on some of these diesel pickup trucks. So they put two of them on there. Um, the voltage, this is the way it is always, the voltage to the I terminal on the alternator turns on the voltage regulator. Um, and just, that's just a rule of thumb. Typically, it goes through the charging, the, the battery light. If you're going to work on a charging system and you switch on the vehicle and the battery light doesn't work, you better find out why that battery light doesn't work before you do anything else. Uh, because you can throw alternators on there all day long. You know, and if you've got some kind of a problem on that charge light or its circuit, then the alternator is not going to put out. Uh, now, this is a standalone system. And the voltage regulator gets a 12 volt turn on feed, like I was just talking about. Through the, through the warning light. Now, whenever you switch on the key, I'm going to get me a red wire here. Uh, this comes through here and it goes right down there and it turns on. See the I terminal? It turns on the light. Just about every alternator has got an I terminal on it and that's necessary to turn on the light. Now, on this one here, you might notice that one leg of the stator is connected the regulator and that's like I was talking about earlier that's how it knows the alternator is putting out because if it's not putting out it drives this to ground see and that turns that light on that's always been an interesting dynamic to me but if you ever measure this right here you're going to see about 7 volts or about 7.5 or something like that you know uh, on that single wire that's coming out of those four just a little white wire, white wire with a black stripe that jumps from one terminal around to the other one. My Explorer's got one of those on it. And um, anyway, this one here is a sense wire that tells the uh, tells the regulator how much voltage is in there, but it also feeds the field, which is the rotor. See, so there's a whole lot going on there. I saw one that had a bad a connection right here, and it was overcharging the battery. You know, the battery had like 17 volts or something like that and it was overcharging the battery and when I measured the voltage at this pin it only had 12.2 because it was dropping voltage at that connector right there and that was causing it to overcharge it wasn't the regulator's fault the regulator was just operating with the voltage that it had there was enough current to feed the field but the voltage drop that was being caused by the consumption of the power at the field cause the alternator to overcharge. I hope I didn't confuse you too much with that. Alright, so the PCM control of the field was where Chrysler went in the mid-80s. Um, they actually had a <laughs> the module that would do that. This is, a, this is the starter, the automatic shutdown relay. 
powers up the injectors and the alternator field and other solenoids and stuff. It's an automatic shutdown relay powered up the field and the other, the PCM, would sense the voltage. It even senses a lot of these Chrysler products. It measures the temperature of the battery so that it knows what the temperature of it is too. Uh, but so you got power from here and then you got ground coming from the PCM to that terminal right there. See, so that terminal is going to be pulsing a ground in here based on what it sees, it knows the battery has for voltage. System voltage is going to be the same throughout the system. Now, current won't be, but voltage will be the same everywhere. You know, current's going to have to do with what's being consumed by whatever component you're measuring the current going to. All right. Now, Chrysler's setup is pretty darn, if, I just want to give you a little bit uh, of a look at that. Uh, these are the two terminals right here that you see, the field terminals. Uh, and this right here would be your big battery output terminal, you can see um, down here. And then there's your field terminals. And notice the junction is made right there where the wire connects to the starter. So the battery connects there and then they run it. A lot of automakers do that. They'll have the alternator connected to the battery wire at the starter and that's how it feeds the power back to the battery. Now you can actually do voltage drop testing from this big wire to the positive side of the battery and you can find out how much voltage is being lost. And on the positive side, positive post, charging system operating, engine running. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to have over about a half of a volt of drop there. If you've got drop, you're probably going to start seeing some burned connections because where current's flowing and there's resistance, there's going to be heat and it's going to cause issues with melting and oxidizing and all that kind of stuff. Charging system testing is not terribly complicated. You can get an idea of what's going on with a voltmeter, but it's better to be able to measure amps with an inductive probe. You can buy these things. Now, if you go to Harbor Freight and buy one of those $13 ones, it only measures AC. It won't measure DC. So if you buy one, make sure you get one that will measure DC current. I've got one that's blunk, that was uh, created by General Technologies Corporation that works really smooth. Um, you can also use your scope with a inductive pickup and get a really good idea too. Uh, but, you know, if you're seeing 14 and a half volts, then you typically can feel like, well, this is pretty much what's going on is okay. You know, like if you go to cranking the car up, now, if, if you spin the car over for a while or if the battery was dead, you're, not, you're liable not to see 14 and a half volts. You know, like if somebody left their lights on and ran the battery down, you know, and then you had to jump it off, you may to put your voltmeter on there and read only like 12.5 until the alternator feeds enough juice in there to bring the battery up to what it's supposed to be. Um, so that's an important caveat there. Um, but in those circumstances where the voltage is like 12 and a half because the battery is coming back up, that's when your your uh, inductive amp clamp uh, is a good thing because you can basically tell how much is going into the battery um, and you know get an idea of also how well the alternator is working. Um, what I always like to do to get a full picture of how well the alternator is putting out is I like to clamp this uh, inductive probe it's around the uh, wire that's coming out of the alternator and I point it away from the alternator toward the battery okay and you can get that'll give you everything that's leaving that alternator. Now when you look at just look at the, what's going into the battery uh, there may be some current going other places because there's other stuff pulling loads on the car. You go around that alternator you're doing better. Look about 14 volts, 14 and a half is usually the target voltage the regulator wants. Um, but the amperage will vary with measured battery voltage. In, incidentally if you got one that's overcharging you may wind up you know destroying some of the bulbs in your uh, lighting system so be careful about you know, having one that overcharges for very long. Um, full fielding is something we used to do on this old GM alternator you see over here on the left you know that one there we would you could look in that one of those holes there were several of them and there was a little tab there the voltage regulators built into this one and you could actually ground the tab to the side of that test I mean the side of that to the housing and it would fulfill the alternator. It would bypass the regulator. It would go fulfill the alternator. You could see what it was capable of putting out. 
um, on the Fords, there's a F terminal, and it, it, on this regulator right here, it'll say something like ground here to test. You know, they even show them grounding it there to test. That's full filling. But you can't, you, and check, you know, like well, I've got my meter right here. And make darn sure that you uh, don't just hack around trying to do this without knowing what you're doing, because you will burn something up. Uh, so if you, there's a lot of these alternators now are built so that there's no way you can full field them. So don't assume that you can do this on every alternator because that's just not the way it is. Uh, but you can get an idea, and this is the, the way I got this, this thing connected. This is the right way to find out what's going from the alternator into the rest of the electrical system. I can't say, I can't I say that enough. And once again, the arrow on your, the, on the side of this for current flow, needs to be pointing toward the battery from the alternator. And so if anytime you're using any kind of an inductive pickup, it's going to be pointing toward the battery on the positive side or away from it on the negative side. That's just the way that is. Now the rotor should have about four to six ohms. Sometimes just for the sake of argument, I'll measure the rotor. Because a lot of times when you take the brushes out, you know, you can take them off from the outside. These brushes here were worn out in a uh, Dodge Caravan. I posted this picture before when I was talking about that Dodge Caravan. But um, when the bus, that's the, the most common cause of alternator not putting out anymore is worn out brushes. And in a lot of cases, the brushes are very easy to change. Not in every case. Some alternators, the brushes are a pain to change them. Uh, but on the Fords that have the regulator, you can see from the outside there with the little four torque screws. It's really easy to change that. Heck, sometimes you can even change it with the alternator on the vehicle, but I always pull it off anyway because you don't want to, you know, but I always disconnect the battery too. You don't want to short something out, <laughs> you know, but um, but anyway, there's your uh, you know, measure in that. Incidentally, when Visteon rebuilds an alternator, they measure the diameter of these of these slip rings and they'll actually make bring them back to their original size. A lot of the other manufacturers will just put new brushes rubbing against worn slip rings and that's not really a good thing either. But you might notice this brush right here was worn down more than that one there was and it got to the point of where it wasn't making contact and so that alternator wasn't getting any field at all. Now the stator rectifier connection works like that. Um, you know, you're, you got this is grounded right here and then you, your power comes out right here and then see the alternating current that's created in here by that rotor spinning in there is going to be sent to these three legs on this rectifier. The rectifiers don't always look the same, but you can get the idea. There's all these diodes in there. But look at this one here. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's your six diodes. One, two, three, four, five, six. You've got positive diodes and you've got negative diodes. Now, a bad positive diode in some of your older GM cars, when you switch the key off, the battery light would stay on. Uh, on some of your pickup trucks that were using the stator output wire, that 7 volt thing, to heat up the choke, it was really stupid because the way that they had it set up, when the alternator wouldn't put out, the choke light would come on on the dash. The yellow choke light. It's the craziest thing I ever saw. But that's always what that meant. When you saw the choke light come on, you knew the alternator wasn't putting out. That was kind of like their battery light on some of them 70s vintage Chevys. Um, all right, the ripple. Uh, I used to, when I wasn't sure about the health of the stator, and some of these charging system testers will turn on a red light when you don't, when you, that you can't trust to tell you the stator is bad. I would always hook a scope up. You can check this ripple either using the... Um, Voltage, you got to set your scope up right now. You, gotta use, you can either use voltage or you can use amperage to get this ripple. Uh, but, you know, the testers, I got a couple of testers that will actually give me ripple on that. And here are some sample patterns. You can capture these measuring volts or amps if you know how to set the scope up the right way. And you can look at these patterns here. Um, but usually, this is what I like to see right here. This kind of pattern right here. When I see one that looks like that on the scope, and this is one that I captured, I don't like that, and I'm going to put it on there. I want to see one that looks like this. Now, I will tell you this. The voltage from here to here is important, too, and that's a measurement that factors in. 
some of the tools will actually do that for you. Like here, we're getting ready to do what? To taste a starter. No. We're going to check the. We're going to check the. I <laughs> take a powder, right? We're going to yeah. check the uh, alternator Actually. stator and both these alternators. Both these alternators look just alike. Only one of them new and the other one's old. Yeah. This one came off of this Ford van over here. It wasn't putting out. We checked it with our charging system tester, and now we've got his meter. And if you notice on the meter, we got the meter set up on diode check. And this is a $17 meter like you can buy every day at the parts house. You don't have to have a really expensive meter to do this. All right, now this, this big post right here is where the big red wire hooks that goes eventually around to the battery and it charges the battery. And this housing between here and here, there's a bunch of diodes and we're going to check those diodes really quick right now on this old alternator. He's touching the, you got to scratch into that really good. See that? He's got a reading that way. All right, scratch it good, George, so you only got a good connection. That aluminum's ugly. All right, you're going to see he's touching the housing with one. He's touching the, the big red wire with the other one. And look at that. He's got a really low reading there. Okay, now trade hands with your, with your, with your trade places with your leads. All right, scratch it good. All right. All right, scratch it good. Look at there. He's reading low on both sides. See what I'm saying? Now that's not supposed to be that way. Now we're going to check this one here, this new one. It's a little easier to get a good connection on the case on it. All right, and uh, that way he's actually checking it from the hot side of the battery to the housing. Now swap hands, George. Okay, and now look what he's getting. He's getting a kind of a high reading one way and no reading the other way, and that's telling us that these diodes and this other alternator are bad. Now I will say this. Let me go so far as to make this statement. You can have other problems with an alternator. It can st it just because it passes the test that we did doesn't mean that alternator is good. But if it fails the test, it does mean that the alternator is bad. So that's the point. So if it fails that test, you're, in, you're through. If it doesn't fail the test, that doesn't mean the alternator is good because you can still have worn out brushes, you can have a bad regulator, you can have an open rotor. There's all kinds of stuff that can be wrong. And so that concludes that little piece of video. Okay, well we got our, our bad diode on that alternator that's making it not read like it's supposed to. And so that pretty well seals the deal on this thing. We put another alternator on it for $115 from the parts house. They gave us a really good price on it. And then our charging system just hooked up to it. That doesn't really look all that bad. George, turn that load knob a little bit to the right. A little bit to the right, turn the load knob to the right, turn it to the right. No, that's the right. right. <laughs> yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, the load light will come on in a minute. Come on, turn it more in that, turn it more. Come on. Come on. Come on. There it is, there's your load light. Alright, see there. See that? Now we, we, okay, let off. See that thing is not, it's, it's anemic. Because we're hooking, we're coming right off of there. This thing ought to show a lot more amps than it does. Rev it up a little bit, George. Raise, raise the engine speed a little bit. Let me see this a little better. So George is going to raise the engine speed. It's really bad. The noise it's making. Now, the interesting thing is, when we check the diode... Oh, look at there! The diode, when we push the diode button to check the C, and it tells us the diodes are bad. Bad, George, bad. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what I was getting at in that previous one was when you load the system and it pulls the voltage down, you should see the amperage jump way up to just about the max because you're measuring it right there at the battery. Um, so on that other one, you notice when we load it, the one I just showed you in the video, the amperage stayed down low and furthermore we're hearing all that whining from the bad stator. Um, overrunning alternator pulleys, it's got like one way clutch on the inside of it, lets the rotor, rotor of the alternator coast to a stop when the engine is shut down. Um, you know, it's got several features, but one thing it does is it eliminates chirp. That happens when the engine decelerates. You can buy these pulleys for about 60 or $70 if you got one that's making a bunch of racket. And then they will make some racket when they go bad usually. Or running pulley slips freely in one direction, immediately locks in the other. Uh, usually about 60,000 miles, they say you need to replace the pulleys. You can get by without these or with an alternator without one, but you know, 
I usually try to put them back like they were. Now this is sort of like the Sprague in an automatic transmission. Have you noticed the way that those rollers are? See them rollers in there? The way they are. All right. So this one here has got a spiral spring that it let, it lets it run one way freely, but it locks the other way. See. And so there's a when you pop this plastic cover off, you can see that there's a 17 millimeter hex. And a lot of the times, whenever you buy a replacement pulley, it'll come with a 17 millimeter hex that you can stick in there and spin with a socket or whatever. If you go ahead and spin it with the uh, impact wrench, you know you can break it loose and spin it right on off of there. Uh, and it's not left-hand thread; it's you know turns the right way. Well, that pretty well winds up our talk on alternators, and I hope you guys really have a good week, and I thank you for tuning in to these 31 slides, and I'll see you guys next time. Give me some comments. Let me know how you like this. You know, put a like on it, share it, whatever you feel like doing. Thanks.